Hi, I'm Josh, and this is Mountain Roots. In this 24th episode of Exploring Appalachia, I'm back in East Kentucky, just a couple months after the historic floods of 2022. Now, I don't want to ignore those events or the lives that were lost, so I do want to take a moment to acknowledge them from the outset of this episode. But seeing that I have produced other episodes about flooding in Appalachia this year, I want to instead focus on some positive things to provide encouragement and hope to those affected, to those watching. Appalachians are no strangers to struggle, as I will discuss here, and they can move forward once again and prosper. So welcome to Pike County, Kentucky, Pikeful to be exact. Thanks not only to the long heritage of coal and the support industries here, but the University and Medical Group as well, this is a growing East Kentucky community. It's worth noting the county is celebrating its bicentennial this year. And although I missed it back in April, Pikeville hosted its annual Hillbilly Days, which is a multi-day festival fundraiser that's been held every year since the late 1970s, with the exception of 2020, to help the Shriners Children's Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. Nearly 100,000 people come to the festival, filling the streets, enjoying the carnival and parade, and concerts while experiencing Appalachian culture. Pikeville is rich in Appalachian lore and history. I found myself like a moth to the flame drawn to the Hatfield and McCoy graveyard and the McCoy house, which here stands the home of McCoy patriarch Randolph McCoy and his wife Sarah. They moved here after the Hatfields burned their previous home in the late 1880s. If you watched my previous episode on Hazard, Kentucky, you know I discussed how feuds in Appalachia have been portrayed in the media, oftentimes exaggerating the violence and the number of those killed, like the French Eversol War or feud in Hazard. The Hatfield and McCoy feud is likely no different. In fact, some argue it has been significantly over-exaggerated in order to continue the narrative of painting the people of Appalachia as violent and uncivilized. Now this isn't to say the feud didn't happen or even minimize what did happen. But over a span of about 30 years or so, some estimate 50 plus people were killed in the feud. Others say it was far less depending on how you figure or account for the deaths. As these things go, the feud is a web of complex dynamics set against the backdrop of broader events such as the war between the states, commonly known as the Civil War. Add to that the passions of romance, alleged theft of personal property, and you've got the makings for an all-out feud. Now to give you a rough outline of the feud, on the Hatfield side you had William Anderson Hatfield, known as Devil Ants, calling the shots, and on the McCoy side was Randolph McCoy, or Old Randall, who I mentioned earlier. For the most part, the McCoys lived on the Kentucky side of the Tug Fork River, and the Hatfields lived on the West Virginia side. Be sure to watch my episode on Matewan for a little more on that. Ironically, both families fought for the Confederate States of America, with the exception being Asa McCoy, who fought for the Union. And this is really where the bad blood began, because upon his return from the war, he was killed by a Confederate home guard known as the Logan Wildcats. Initially, the blame was placed on Devil Ants, but later, according to McCoy tradition, Devil Ants' uncle got the blame for the murder, although there was never a conviction. Nearly 13 years passed before the next incidents occurred between the two families, escalating the feud, that being the infamous dispute over who owned a particular hog. It's said that one of Devil Ants' cousins, Floyd Hatfield, owned it, but that old Randall McCoy claimed it was his based on the notches that had been made in the pig's ear. You see, this was before livestock was given ear tags as they are today. The dispute was taken to a local court where the presiding judge ruled in favor of the Hatfields. Did I mention that this justice of the peace was a Hatfield himself? But before you get the wrong idea, to make things more complex, the justice made his ruling based on the testimony of Bill Statton, who was related to both the Hatfields and McCoys. Sadly, two McCoy brothers later killed Bill, but were acquitted on account of self-defense. To add fuel to the fire, later on, Rosanna McCoy fell in love with Devil Ants' son, Johnsy, a real Mountain Romeo and Juliet story. She left her family to live with the Hatfields in West Virginia, and as you can imagine, this did not sit well with the McCoys. I'll let you dig deeper into that sad chapter of this story. But the height of the feud was reached on New Year's night in 1888, when the Hatfields surrounded the cabin of Randolph and Sarah McCoy, setting it on fire to drive them out into the open to be shot. Although most of the family was able to escape, tragically, two of the McCoy children were shot and killed during their effort to get to safety. This led to Sarah and Randolph moving to that home here in Pikeville that I showed you earlier. In the months and years after the New Year's massacre, both governors of West Virginia and Kentucky threatened to invade one another's states with militias. Battles and eventual trials would ensue, and the feud would slowly come to an end. In 2003, 
McCoy Cousins and Pikeville partnered with Rio Hatfield of Waynesboro, Virginia to declare an official truce between the families. Their hope was to show you don't have to fight forever. There are other chapters in the story to be told, for freedom and not feuding. I've seen everything from dinner shows bearing the Hatfield and McCoy name to ATV trail systems with their name. But I also see a lot of their names before me in this graveyard. And as I've said before, the lessons we learn today are written on the tombstones of others. Seeing this graveyard overlook the town, specifically this spot, did you catch the irony there? The city of Pikeville itself started as a settlement in 1824 known as the town of Pike. Later that name was changed to Pikeville in 1850. Pike County, founded in 1822, is Kentucky's easternmost county and the Commonwealth's largest county by land area. Many famous people have come from here, influenced by mountain life in East Kentucky, like country music legends Dwight Yoakam, who wrote Read and Write in Route 23. And Patty Loveless, who I absolutely love her version of You'll Never Leave Harlan Alive, but wrong town. If you're a baseball fan, Hall of Fame pitcher Greg Maddox played here for the Pikeville Cubs, who were one of the Appalachian League's minor league baseball teams in the 1980s. A lot of investment is going into this area of East Kentucky, making it quite a lively place. The city of Pikeville has been the center of rapid development in East Kentucky, benefiting greatly from investments like Pikeville College, which is now the University of Pikeville, and the Pikeville Medical Center, now a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. I made it to Brake Center State Park just before sunset to share some incredible views with you. This park is known as the Grand Canyon of the South and is partly located in Kentucky and Virginia and shared by both in the Jefferson National Forest at the northeastern point of Pine Mountain. The name Brakes came from the break in Pine Mountain created by the Russell Fork of the Big Sandy River as it carved a thousand foot deep gorge on its way to join the Ohio River. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Exploring Appalachia. I've been on a bit of a tour of Eastern Kentucky as of late, and I appreciate all the comments and all the feedback you've given me about the episodes. This is about as breathtaking as it gets, y'all. I've driven through a lot of destruction that's been left behind in the aftermath of the historic flooding in Eastern Kentucky, but I wanted to end on a high note here at the Brakes Park. Thank you.